<clears throat> and all we did the other day was talk about the sorting hat, essentially. And we get introduced to Professor Umbridge. Harry gets in trouble, as we all know. Gets detention. Notice when he gets detention what advice McGonagall gives him. Shut up. Shut up. Keep your head down. She says, you know, surely you realize why Umbridge is here. And if you don't, at least listen to Hermione, who yeah. understands. Okay. Harry says, yeah, but it's not true. And she says, we're not talking about the truth here, Harry. Okay. But he doesn't take her advice very well because he gets detention again. And so he gets detention and he has to write lines. Now, I don't know if writing lines is still a punishment like it was when I was a kid. But I remember one time in grade school, I don't remember, fourth, no, that wasn't fourth grade. It was either fifth or sixth grade. I had to write lines. Unfortunately, this was back when we music was still taught in school. And so you had this one crayon, um, chalk holder that would hold like four or five pieces of chalk so you could draw, you know, the thing that you could write music on. And so being the sneaky little person I was, I wrote, you know, something like, I'm going to start talking class with that. So... One line became five lines, and I think I needed 200 or something like that. I like that better than Harry's. Um, so we see Harry write his lines and such. Um, Percy and Padfoot, Percy writes his, you know, disgusting letter. And Sirius talks to Harry, and Harry tells him about Umbridge, page 50, uh, excuse me, 302. He says, I know about her from reputation. I'm sure she's no death eater. Right at the middle of 302. Harry, she's foul enough to be one. Serious. Yes, but the world isn't split into good people and death eaters. Notice that. She's a nasty piece of work. You should hear Remus talk about her. So, the world isn't split between good people. What's he mean, good people and death eaters? Okay. Yeah. Just because you might not be a good person doesn't make you automatically a death eater. In other words, you can be a rotten person. You can be a foul, stinking person. You can be an evil person and not be a death eater. Okay? Doesn't, doesn't mean... Only evil people, doesn't mean all evil people are death eaters. Right. Well, doesn't he have, like, something like multiple places? Isn't there, like, kind of a thing where, like, like his supporters? Yeah, they didn't exist before him. They're, you know, um, like Hitler's brown shirts, essentially. I mean, they're his supporters. They get his mark, that kind of thing. Okay? So, Sirius goes on and tells... Harry, Fudge thinks Dumbledore, I mean, we've already heard this before. Fudge thinks Dumbledore is, you know, um, up against him. He's worried that Dumbledore is, you know, going to kind of overthrow the ministry. And then we get the Hogwarts High Inquisitor. Okay. So what does she start inquisiting? Okay. Before then, the professors. She starts going around to teachers' classes in their classes while they're trying to teach and starts asking them questions. You know, what do we find out, for example, about Snape? When did he first apply to teach at Hogwarts? 14 years ago, which miraculously just happens to be one year after Harry was born. Probably about the very same time that he turned against Voldemort. Okay? And what did he apply for? And what did he apply for the next year? And for all 14 years. What does that tell us? A new teacher for 14 years. Okay? That's why Hagrid says, book one, the job's jinxed. Oh, excuse me, book two, the job's jinxed. Which is why Lockhart got it. Okay? Um... We find out when she inquisits, you know, investigates uh, McGonagall. McGonagall's been there 49 years, and McGonagall shuts her up, you know, just puts her in her place, okay? Let's go on. So, 326, 327, towards the end of that chapter, 
Describe defense against the dark arts. How's it being taught? Okay. What kind of learning is it? Theory. It's all theory. Your aerospace, right? Pilot. How many of you want Travis to get his pilot's license without ever getting off the ground? Because he's right about it. Yeah, no. I, you know, you don't want your kid to get a driver's license without having driven a car. Doesn't work. Defense against the dark arts is the same kind of thing, at least according to the students. But she thinks, well, as long as you know the theory, that's all that's important. Now, I could be entirely wrong here. But I think that when Rowling wrote this, she was taking a shot at the entire educational establishment. Because, well, that is schools of education. An awful lot of professors of education think the theory of teaching is everything. Coming in and doing it, totally different. Okay? I, I tell students who are planning on going on either, you know, to be secondary ed teachers or going on to be college teachers, et cetera. You don't know anything until you have to teach it to somebody. So if you have an opportunity to tutor in your respective field, tutor, because that way you'll learn what you know and what you don't know. Because if you can't explain it, you don't know it. Okay? Anyways. So Hermione 326 comes up with an idea. She says, we're not learning anything in defense in defense against the dark arts, so we need to have somebody teach us. And Harry, well, if you're talking about, no, I'm not talking about Lupin. He can't, obviously. Well, who? Well, you, Harry. Me what? Talk about you teaching us. Harry's like, what? Ron, that's an idea. What's an idea? You teaching us to do it. But I'm not a teacher. I, you're the best at defense against the dark arts. Harry says, no, I'm not. You beat me in every test. And she says, um, no, I haven't. Okay. And then Ron's like, you know, on second time, I don't want somebody this dense trying to teach us. So, Ron and Hermione start going. First year, second year, third year, fourth year. And every time they say, Harry, you did, what does Harry do? Yeah, well, so and so. Yeah, I had help. I had help. I had help. But, if you go back to earlier in the book, when Ron and Hermione were made prefects, Harry's like, well, where were they when? Okay. Kind of interesting, I think at least. Yeah, little voice, you know. Whether or not it's one of those voices you should tell other people you hear it. You know. So, Harry says, I'll think about it. In the hog's head. Okay. So, Hermione... Tells a few people. I think she tells Harry two or three. And they go to Hogs meeting. They go to the Hogshead. Starting on page 337 through the top of 338, we get named all the people who show up. And does this include? Not including Harry, Ron, and Hermione. 25 people. That's a couple. Okay. That's a lot of people. Notice they come from all the houses but one. Slytherin. There are no Slytherins there. Okay. And they kind of all want to do this. With the exception of one guy. Zacharias Thundy, right? Is that his name? Pretty sure that's him. Yeah, Zacharias Smith, okay? And Fred and George, you know, has various ways of persuading him to shut up. <clears throat> What's he there for? What's he want to hear? What happened to Cedric? And Harry's like, man, if you want to hear what happened to Cedric, yeah, I'm here for the wrong reason. I'm not going to talk about it. Why is that important? Because that plants an idea. What's the idea? Well, we get a later chapter, The Beetle at Bay, where Hermione 
uses the blackmail that she has on Rita Skeeter to extort her, essentially, into writing an article. What's the article all about? Exactly what happened. Exactly what Harry saw. Okay. Educational degree number 24, no private groups. So somebody saw them. Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch again. I'm trying to get us up quickly to a place. So Dumbledore's army. Harry needs a room for 28 people. He tells Dobby. Dobby tells him about the room of requirement. Okay. And... They have their first lesson. Do they have their first lesson there or not? Yes, they have their first lesson. And what do we see? How's Harry do at teaching? How do we know? Who? Neville. Very first lesson. Neville can do an Expelliarmus. Okay, Harry's back is turned to him. He doesn't have his wand, wand raised. But still, it's Neville. He actually made Harry's wand fly out of his hand. Okay? A little bit of foreshadowing there, by the way. Uh, Lion and Serpent, I'm just going to skip entirely. Hagrid's Tale, yeah, we'll skip that too. Go to the Eye of the Snake. Why is it important? Because Harry has a dream that turns out not to be a dream. He sees... Mr. Weasley attacked. Um, he talks to Dumbledore. Dumbledore wants to know, how did you see this? Harry says, well, it's kind of, he goes, no, no, you don't understand. He's, oh, well, I was the snake. Dumbledore's like, cool. Not really, but I understand. Okay. And he sends them off to the Weasleys using a port key. And the next day they go to St. Mungo's. Okay. Bottom of 491, end of that chapter, St. Mungo's Magic Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. They're outside Arthur's room. Some of the Order of Phoenix are inside, and Harry gets to use extendable ears. And what does he overhear? No, it's not that he's going crazy. That Voldemort might be possessing him. 491, of course he's worried, growls Moody. The boy's seeing things from inside, you know, who's Snake. Obviously, Potter doesn't realize what that means. But if you know who's possessing him, which makes Harry, the next day, stay away from everybody else. Stays in his room and has a nice long talk with Phineas Nigellus, previous headmaster of Hogwarts. Other than Sirius, I, I I was going to say, other than Sirius, the last remaining member of the Black family, but he's dead. Yeah. It's his picture that's somehow alive. Anyways, um, and he kind of convinces Harry, and Jenny convinces Harry that what? Does he have any long blackout periods, periods where he doesn't remember? No, he doesn't. Okay. So, Christmas Day, they go back to... St. Mungo's, and we get the chapter, chapter 23, Christmas on the Closed Ward. They run into Lockhart, and we see Broderick Bode. Plant is delivered to him, which they should immediately recognize. Why? Because Harry, Ron, and Hermione fell into one of these things that tried to kill them in the very first book. Now, okay, this is a baby one, little one, offshoot if you want. Anyways, Ron sees Neville. Yeah, did too. Bottom of 512. It's us, Neville, says Ron. Who have you been visiting? And we see Neville's grandmother, friends of yours, Neville, dear. Neville looks as though he'd rather be anywhere in the world. And she says, oh, I know who you are. She points out Harry, and you two are Weasleys, clearly, and you must be Hermione. Neville talks about you. Neville's told me all about you, and she mentions Neville's parents. Ron, bottom of 513. Is that your dad down there, Dan Neville? 
You haven't told your friends about your parents? Neville shakes his head. Nothing to be ashamed of. Top of 514. You should be proud, Neville. Proud. They didn't give their health and sanity so their only son would be ashamed of them. You should be proud that your parents are vegetables, Neville. Essentially is what she's saying. He says, I'm not ashamed. You've got a funny way of showing it. My son and his wife, and she tells them what happened. Now, notice, of the people there, one of them already knows. Well, two, actually. Three, actually. She knows. Neville knows. Harry knows. Because Dumbledore's told him. And what do we see? We see old Mrs. Longbottom, Alice Longbottom, comes shuffling down the hall. Okay? Again, very well, Alice dear, very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. Neville had already stretched out his hand, into which his mother had dropped an already empty Dribbles blowing gum wrapper. A piece of paper like this. What day is it? Christmas. Neville's mother comes down from behind the curtains, shuffles down. Neville reaches his hand out. She puts it in his hand. What does his grandmother tell him to do with the piece of paper? Throw it away. It's trash. Okay. Neville says, thanks, Mom. Put that paper, in, put that wrapper in the bin. She must have given you, given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. That is, he has enough of these little slips of paper to wallpaper all the walls in his bedroom. That tells us a couple of things. One, most importantly, how often do they come visit? Very often. That's a lot. That's a lot. Of course, they've been doing this for how long? It was a year after Voldemort went away, so it's 13 years. Dumbledore told Harry that he believes Neville visits his parents during the holidays and over the summer. What are the holidays? Christmas break, spring break. And I think it's implied visit means what? Daily over Christmas break, spring break, and the summer vacation period. Daily. Okay? But as they left, Harry notices Neville shoves the piece of paper in his pocket. Why? Why? It's Christmas. That's his Christmas present. So who has it better? Harry or Neville? Does Harry get Christmas presents from his parents? No, but he doesn't have to see that sight every time. True. But what does Neville still have with at least his mother? The connection. There is a connection. There is a connection. Harry doesn't have that. Okay? They all leave. Hermione, I never knew. Ron, nor did I. Ginny, nor did I. Harry, I did! <laughs> Bellatrix Lestrange did that Hermione Bellatrix the woman creature's got a photo of in his den you know nice little creature who's just misunderstood if you pet him and bathe him and give him a nice bath and give him a nice you know bed and stuff and treat him nice and sing to him Occlumency so what is Occlumency and it's corollary legilimency or legilimency, however you want to pronounce it. You're all familiar with this part, but you're familiar with it not spelled that way. You're familiar with it spelled that way, usually with something like that on it. Okay? This means hidden. Occlumency is the mancy the science of, the practice of, the hidden. Okay, so what are you doing? You're hiding, okay? Legilimency, and I've just not looked this one up in all the years I've been teaching this. Legilimency is what? It's the opposite. It's the going into somebody's mind, okay? So, Snape's got to teach Harry Occlumency. Why? Dumbledore wants him to close his mind to Voldemort. He thinks what's in Harry's mind shouldn't go out. Okay? 
So why Snape? Because Dumbledore says he's a good Occlumens. Okay? He has to be. We find out later. Okay? <clears throat> so, Harry and Snape talk about Occlumency. And Snape tells him, Dumbledore doesn't want you connecting with him in that way. And so they have some lessons. Page 534, for example. Now, notice how Snape tells him to do this. Try. Clear your mind. Remove all emotion. Really? Some people spend their lifetimes trying to do that. He has five seconds. You know, Remove all emotion and block me. Here he's like, how do I block you? Is it a, you know, Dr. Strange? You know, He was five, watching Dudley riding a new red bicycle. And his heart was bursting with jealousy. He was nine. Ripper the Bulldog was chasing him up a tree. And the Dursleys were laughing. He was sitting under the sorting hat. It was telling him he would do well at Slytherin. Hermione was lying in the hospital wing, her face covered with thick black fur. Hundred Dementors closing in on him. Cho, coming in for the kill under the mistletoe. He, no, not that. i not going to see that one. Okay. So, Snape says... Or Harry asked, did you see everything? Flashes. To whom did the dog belong? Harry tells him. Why is it significant or important that Snape sees what he saw? Why did he need to see that, in other words? Keep going. How so? Because what has he said about Harry? He's arrogant. He's spoiled, he's Dumbledore's pet, etc. And yet, outside Hogwarts, what kind of family background does Harry have? He doesn't have everything going wonderfully for him. Okay? So, they do it again. Harry sees Cedric. No, you know. Okay? And Snape says, page 536. When Harry says, I'm having, I'm finding that hard at the moment, that that is emptying himself of emotion, then you will find yourself easy prey for the Dark Lord. Fools are wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions, who wallow in sad memories, and allow themselves to provoke, provoke this easily. Weak people, in other words, they stand no chance against his powers. Harry, I'm not weak. Yeah. <laughs> Because you can manufacture memories. You can have memories that aren't real. And you can modify them with, within the magical world, as, which we see in book six. Okay? So Snape says, then prove it. Master yourself. The very same language that was used in, I think it was, um, first chapter, Dudley Demented. Where Harry's thinking, you know, about siphoning off his frustration and everything onto Dudley. And we're told, and then he mastered his impulses. I kind of suggest this whole book is, all, this single book, is about one thing. Harry learning self-control. He's going to be told repeatedly. Learn, I mean, what did um, McGonagall say? Control yourself, Harry. Learn self-control. Master yourself. So that's what Snape says. So he does it again. Okay? And Harry remembers what, you know, part of one dream was. Snape gets angry at him. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, Harry has a vision. Dumbledore's, uh, Voldemort, excuse me. Voldemort is really happy. There's a mass breakout from Azkaban. Skip a bunch. And Hermione gets the upper hand on Rita Skeeter. Now, notice when Hermione gets the upper hand on Rita Skeeter, where is Harry supposed to be? 
with Cho at what, Madame Puddlefoot's, you know, tea room? It's not even a cafe, it's a tea room, and it's frilly and lacy and everything. So he's supposed to be on a date with Cho. And he tells Cho, you know, I've got to meet with Hermione, and she's like, oh, really? You know, and gets all bent out of shape, which frankly, good. I wish somebody, frankly, had killed Cho and just get her out of the store. <clears throat> she doesn't serve any long-term purpose. I'm sorry. Colin Creevy. She helps. Hey, hey. Just. He's a pain. He's fodder for cannon. That's what he's there for. He's just there to add up the body count. Right? Doesn't she disappear? Like, does is she like just like goes away? That's kind of prevalent. She shows up in the seventh book. I mean, she shows up as part of one of those who comes to. Fight, but it's like, woo, look, Cho's there. Yeah, big freaking deal. Okay. <laughs> so here he goes off and talks with, they talk with um, Rita Skeeter, tells her kind of what he saw, and she says the prophet won't publish it. And Hermione says, because that's because it's owned by the government, etc. So she says, you're going to print it in the Quibbler. She says, I'm not going to write anything for the Quibbler. Nobody will really believe that. And she says, well, some will. But some won't, okay? Seen and unforeseen. Skip a bunch. So, Umbridge shows just how stupid she really is. Because what happens when you ban something? Everyone reads it. Back in 1987, Martin Scorsese came out with a film based upon a book by a Greek author named Nikolos Katz. Kaisen Sakis. The book was titled The Temptation of the Christ. The film was called The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay? With um actor who was in another movie. <laughs> Vietnam movie. Can't remember his name. Very distinguished face. Anyways, and it's got a scene here. Christ is hanging on the cross and he has this hallucination of having sex with Mary Magdalene and stuff. Okay? The film was looking to be a box office total flop. I mean, like, Heaven's Gate total flop, you know. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Just bomb. Just nobody seeing it. Until the quote-unquote right-wing Christian community came out of the woodwork and started uh, wanting to ban the film, started... Um, marching and protesting where the film was being played, and pfft, it shot ticket sales up. It's still regarded as one of Scorsese's worst films. I mean, dialogue, acting, the whole nine yards. Okay? So she bans the issue of the quibbler that has Harry's interview. So now, obviously, every student has it, and they're reading it. They're passing it around and such. Okay? Harry has a vision. In the vision, he sees Rookwood telling... Uh, Voldemort that Broderick Bode couldn't have gotten whatever the thing is. Why is this important? Who told Bode that he could have gotten it? It's either the second or third time. I think it's the second. Third time comes later in book seven. That this um, Death Eater gets cruciatus by Voldemort. It's Avery. Back in book four, when they all reappear, Voldemort kind of says, somebody in here is guilty. And Avery falls on his feet, falls on his face and goes, oh, I'm so sorry. But he zaps him. Okay, He's getting zapped here. And then book seven, he's going to get zapped again. So Avery's just a you know moron. He can't do anything right, seemingly. Okay, Go on some more. Here he has another occlumency lesson with um, Snape and Harry, you know, has to explain to Snape what it was he saw, the man kneeling in the room with the Dark Lord and stuff, okay? Um, and so Snape tries it again, page 591, and Harry raises his wand and says, Protego. And now Harry sees something. Top of 592. 
Suddenly, Harry's mind was teeming with memories that were not his. The hook-nosed man was shouting at a cowering woman, with the small, while a small, dark-haired boy cried in a corner. The greasy-haired teenager sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling, shooting down flies. A girl was laughing as a scrawny boy tried to mount a bucking broomstick. Okay. Snape says, wasn't bad. Harry doesn't speak. He felt to say anything might be dangerous. He had just broken into Snape's memories. He had seen scenes from Snape's childhood. It was unnerving to think that the crying little boy he'd watched his parents shouting was standing in front of him. Now, what's just happened to Harry and his understanding of Snape? He got humanized. Maybe there's a reason why he gives the waking face. Okay, so they do it again. And Harry keeps going farther and farther into the, you know, hall and stuff. Um, we see Umbridge try to fire McGonagall, McGonagall, uh, not McGonagall, um, Trelawney. Dumbledore says she stays. He hires Ferenz. Ferenz tells Parvati and the girls, you know, everything that Trelawney taught was nonsense. Okay, we skip a bit. Um, Dobby goes and tries to tell Harry and the others that, you know, they're about to get caught. Harry gets caught, taken up to Dumbledore's office. And who's there? Who's there to essentially arrest Harry? Fudge. Fudge. Umbridge. Umbridge. Kingsley. Dawlish. Okay. McGonagall's there, but she's not there to arrest him. Dumbledore's there. He's not there to arrest him. Um... Who else is in there? Yeah, Marielle, I think is her name, or Marietta or something like that. I mean, she's going to be mentioned. I'll find it in just a moment. Okay. Um, Marietta Edgecombe, that's it. Okay. And she's got her face like this. And when she finally removes her hand, she's got the word sneak, you know, narc, right across her forehead. Okay. So, Dumbledore takes the blame. 618. Dumbledore's army, he says, well, game is up. Shoot, you caught me. Would you like a written confession? And Fudge is, you know, beyond himself. He can't believe he can barely even speak. Okay, notice it's, go ahead. Yeah, Percy's there. It's Dumbledore's army. It's not Harry's army. Harry, you can't blame Harry. This was going to be the first meeting. So he kind of explains it all away. Okay. Um, bottom of 619, Fudge says, okay, well, now you're, you'll be escorted back to the ministry. Well, you'll be formally charged and sent to Azkaban, Dumbledore. I thought we might hit that little snag. Mm -hmm. uh, what snag? Dumbledore explains. It's just you seem to be laboring under the delusion that I'm going to, what is the phrase, come quietly? He says, no, I'm not going to Azkaban. I could break out, of course. Has anybody ever broken out before? Uh, other than the mass breakout earlier in this book, because that wasn't a mass breakout, right? Did Sirius break out? Yeah, he kind of walked out. Okay, it wasn't a breakout. Dumbledore saying, "You don't have any security that can keep me." Okay, I mean he's kind of showing his chops here. So, Dollish is sitting over there, kind of you know trigger fingers. Twitchy, Dumbledore says, don't be silly, Dollish. I'm sure you're an excellent or I seem to remember you achieved outstanding in all your notes. But if you attempt to er, bring me in by force, I will have to hurt you. So what is Dumbledore doing there? Threatening. Threatening, laying down the law. This is master to student. Yeah, I remember when you were taking your notes. That's what, sixth year? Seventh year. Seventh year. You were pretty good, but if you try anything, I'll knock you flat. <laughs> he blinks, okay? So, boom, light, etc. Dumbledore gets ready to go, and what does he tell Harry? 
You must study Occlumency as hard as you can. Do you understand? Do everything Professor Snape tells you. Very next chapter, Snape's worst memory. Okay. So, Fred and George create a ruckus. And here he sees in Snape's office. Six thirty-nine. He sees the pensive. He goes in. We have twelve minutes. Eh, yeah, we can cover this because this is what I, this is what I really wanted to get to today. He goes in. What is Snape's worst memory? Specifically, when he's hung upside down. Is it when he's hung upside oh, no, down? No, no, no. What does he say to Lily? I don't need your help, you filthy little motherfucker. That's the worst memory. It's not being hung upside down. It's not being belittled. It's not being picked on. Okay? But we'll get to that. So, this is Snape's memory, right? So we're in the Great Hall. They're having their exams. Harry looks at people. There's his father. There's Sirius. There's Lupin. There's Pettigrew. They're Snape. This is Snape's memory. What should Snape's memory be seeing? Only the stuff that Snape sees. Okay? So, they all get up and leave. And where does Harry go? He goes off with James and Sirius and Pettigrew. In Lupin. Snape isn't even there yet. Snape can't even be seen yet when he goes off with them. And he's watching them, and they're being jerks, okay? Five, six forty-five. Show me the exact line where it says that. Okay? Harry looked, um, 6.43, here it is, 6.43. Harry looked anxiously behind him again. Snape remained close by, still buried in his examination questions. So Snape is close by, but he's like this. Right? But this was Snape's memory. And Harry was sure that if Snape chose to wander off in a different direction, once outside in the grounds, he, Harry, would not be able to follow James any further. But if Snape is buried in his exam, how can he hear everything that happens? How can he be aware of that and still be surprised by it? Because 645, right in the middle of the page, serious. I'm bored. Wish it was full of them. Meaning, Lupin. and Lupin has to go through the excruciating pain of transforming into a werewolf. But, hey, I can become a dog now, so that's cool. You might, says Lupin. Okay. We still got transfiguration. If you're bored, you can test me here. I don't need to look at that rubbish. I know it all. Probably true. Okay. So. Sirius, uh, James, this will liven you up, Patfoot. Look who it is. Sirius's head turned. He had become very still, like a dog that has sent it to rabbit. Excellent. Snivellous. And there's Snape on his feet again, stowing the owl. So, this is Snape's memory. Snape doesn't hear. Sirius goes, snivellous, and go the other direction. Or Snape doesn't pull out his wand and go, it's a damn. You're not going to call me Snivellus again, you know. And come at him, full boat barrels blaring. It doesn't make sense in terms of how the memory is reported. But leave all that alone. So what do we see James and Sirius do, but not Lupin and Pettigrew? They pick on him. They pick on him. They pick a fight. They start a fight. 
I'm not saying Snape is innocent here, because I mean he almost immediately. Okay, but what starts it? Sirius is bored. Go back to the Quidditch match. Why do the Death Eaters have the poor Roberts family turning upside down in the air for fun? James and Sirius pick on, on Snape. Why? For fun. Okay. Which is why when Harry comes out of the memory, okay, I mean, we see Lily come in. She tells them to stop. James says, you know, if you go out on a date with me, what a slimy person he is, okay? She says, never. And that's when Snape then says, you know, I don't need help from filthy little mudbloods like her. She blinks. Fine. James says, apologize, et cetera, et cetera. Snape says, so, enjoying yourself, Potter? Having fun? Amusing man, your father, wasn't he? Notice what Snape's doing when he says that. He's diverting Harry's attention from what? From Lily. He wants Harry to think his worst memory is what? What your father did to me. Not what I said to her. Okay. I didn't, you won't repeat this to me. Oh, and by the way, no more occlumency. Dumbledore said, study, study really, really hard. Practice with Snape. Do everything Snape says. And now Snape says, go stick your head in a hole. Okay. Career advice. What's Harry want to be? Duh. An Auror. Of course, man. I mean, what else is he going to be? Work in Department of Ministry for eclectic parts or whatever? I mean, like Arthur Weasley? No. Who comes to his defense? Who says, I will be with you, and I will do everything in my last breath to make sure you become one? Why? I exactly agree. I don't think it's much. It's as much because she thinks Harry would be such a good horror. But if Umbridge is going to take the opposite position, McGonagall's going to, you know, chew her up. Okay. So, Grop, we can skip. Owls. What's significant about the owls chapter? I mean, Harry falls asleep again. Kind of a placement exam. Okay, what else? What is he asked to do? I heard you can do a, a corporeal Patronus. And there's Umbridge. And he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> you know. Out of the fire. So, he has a nightmare. What's the nightmare? Voldemort's got serious. And what does Hermione have to break to Harry that nobody's ever said to him before? He has a hero complex. She doesn't call it a hero. Well, she does say at one point hero complex. She uses another phrase. A messiah complex, she says. You have to save people. Goes all the way back to the first book, right? Throws his hand up, stops strangling from going up to the blood unicorn blood sucking thing that is Voldemort, etc. Okay? And in every other book he saves people, etc. etc. Okay? Page 733. This isn't a criticism, Harry, but you, you do sort of, you know, you, you got a bit of a saving people thing. What is that supposed to mean? And she explains. Why is that significant? Because it's not a, it's a saving people thing. It's what? It's what he is. When Lucius Malfoy calls him Patronus Potter, that is the only true thing Lucius Malfoy ever says. That is what Harry is. Right? So, she says, come on, Harry. Think about this how? Rationally. Let's look at this. What time is it? Five. We're told it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. She says, come on. There's got to be a lot of people at the ministry. It's got to be full of people. Right? 
You really think Voldemort's got serious there? Because bear in mind, outside of Voldemort, who's the most wanted person in the wizarding world? It's serious. Okay. And she says, don't you think maybe this is why Dumbledore wanted you to take occlumency to shut your mind off? Voldemort knows you, Harry, 734. He took Ginny down into the Chamber of Secrets to lure you. It doesn't matter. If they've taken McGonagall to St. Mungo's, right, because she got hit with spells, etc. There isn't any time left. Okay, I'm not having nightmares. I'm not just dreaming, blah, blah, blah. So she finally gets him to accept. Okay, okay. We'll try your way. What's the proof they're going to get? And do what? They're going to see if Sirius is at number 12, Grimmel Place. Who do they speak to? Oh, look who's back. Because who wasn't there most of Christmas break? Creature. Why was a creature there? Because here Sirius yelled at him, get out. And notice Dobby tells us, if you're not specific with your commands, what can house elves do? They can interpret. They can go, ooh, I can interpret this. Get out means leave the house. Go where I want. Does it mean he can betray them? No, he can't. Why? He's not the secret keeper. Okay? So when we come back on Wednesday, we're going to pick up with page 764, the Department of Mysteries. Okay? And... We'll finish this. We're going to be very quickly in Department of Ministries because then we're going to get to the prophecy, which is going to take 45 minutes. It could take 45 hours, but we don't have that time.